The essayist William Hazlett once wrote that the least pain in our little finger gives us more concern and uneasiness than the destruction of millions of our fellow creatures. What do you think? Is that too harsh or is that about right? The least pain in our little finger causes us more distress than the destruction of millions of our fellow creatures. Well, even if you think that Hazlitt is too severe there in his estimate of our callousness, there is no denying the staggering amount of money in our society that's spent on medications to control or to eliminate pain. Seminars, surgeries, spiritualities, all are deployed in our battle against pain. And with good reason, it seems. Uh, pain is bad, right? Surely has, ha, things haven't gone so wrong in the world that you actually need a sermon here to tell you that pain is bad. We seem to understand innately that pain is bad. It must be part of the definition of pain. It's something we don't like. It's something that affects us negatively. Pain is bad. I mean, um, unless you're a masochist, someone who finds pain pleasurable, then pain seems to be, by very nature, something that we want to avoid. Whether it's physical pain or psychological pain, we want to avoid it. After all, we have a basic instinct for survival and for self-preservation that seems to have been put in us. It seems to cause this innate avoidance of pain. So we recognize pain as something bad immediately. No one has to tell us. But we tend, I think, to mean more than that when we say that pain is bad. I think behind this is the assumption that good is immediately self-evident. That is, that it's instantly obvious to us when something is good. And that when something is painful or difficult or hard, then we take it to mean that that is not good. Those things we feel, those things are bad. It's just common sense, we say. Well, if that's what you think our passage this morning should be interesting to you, James chapter 1 The first 18 verses is our passage. It's found on page 1,266 in your pew Bibles. This little letter of James that we'll be looking at for the next few weeks was perhaps one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament. And it's certainly one of the most straightforward. And I think it's exactly because of this, because of its very direct, practical teaching, that this book has been so misunderstood and caricatured on the one hand, And so loved and treasured on the other. And above all, so regularly avoided. James, who identifies himself here in verse 1 simply as a servant of God, James writes to these Christians about a religion that's practical. About a faith that works. Uh, Don't let all the mystical sounding talk about spirituality these days fool you. By and large, I think the mystical experiences that people want are ones which will give certainty of purpose in their daily lives. The books on spirituality they may buy at the bookstore are books which talk about the kind of spirituality that can give them practical benefits, that can calm their nerves or lower their blood pressure. That's what people want. People want faith that works. And that's what this letter of James is all about. It's about a very practical kind of faith, a practical Christianity. And the first part of this letter is a very practical concern, particularly how you and I should regard painful experiences, how we should react to the trials and tribulations of life. Look with me at James chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. 
Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of all he created. Well, what James thinks that these scattered Christians should think about trials couldn't be more obvious. He says there in verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, Now, this may seem a strange idea to us about trials, uh, uh, counterintuitive to say the least. Trials, uh, a reason for joy? Well, if something was a reason for joy, we wouldn't call it a trial. Uh, We say that when when we we offer to do something for somebody that we find hard in order to reassure them that it's all right. No, it's no trouble, we say, even if it's extremely hard. We say it's no trouble because we mean at the end of the day, when you wash it all out, I want to do this, I take joy in this, it's no trial. So here for him to say, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Oh, this seems passing strange to us. But it's clearly what James wants, the first truth he wants to impress on their minds. And you can understand why he would want to be so clear about this. Because it's not something that any of us naturally thinks. It's not how we naturally think about trials. Naturally, as I said, you and I want to avoid trials. We want to choose the easy path. But James here wants to discourage these Christians from choosing the easy path. He's going to have a lot of things to talk to them about in this letter that we'll come to, Lord willing, in the weeks that that follow that are not easy. And James, very wisely, is beginning with exactly what he knows will be the nub of resistance to his advice. We naturally want to choose the easy way. We don't want to deal with the difficult situations, the hard problems. And so James begins by telling us that when we find these things that are hard, we shouldn't necessarily turn away from them and choose the easy path. Though that's natural to us, James wants to discourage these Christians from doing that and to encourage them to do the strange thing, to be willing to walk the hard path and to walk it with joy. And so, he writes, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In the Greek, the first words are this pure joy. It's all joy. That's what he begins with. It's an explosively joyous beginning. Kind of like the Christmas hymn, joy to the world. You know how that music just explodes out with those words. Well, that's exactly what James does here in verse 2, the very beginning of his letter. All joy. Well, again, it's good that he's explosive about this because this is a strange thing to say. To, to consider this all joy? He mentions a particular situation, the facing of trials of many kinds, he says. Now, this is, as I say, not what we would normally consider a reason for rejoicing. Trials of many kinds? But James is emphatic about this. And he obviously doesn't just, doesn't just have one in mind. He says trials of many kinds. He's writing to Christians scattered over a wide area who could be facing many different kinds of situations. 
trials of many kinds. He says in verse 2, whenever. Not even if. He seems to assume it's going to be the case. Whenever you face trials of many kinds. So friends, we could all write them down on pieces of paper and pass them in and read them out. Confusion, fear, sorrow. Whatever you may have this morning. Fear of loneliness or poverty. Witnessing injustice that grieves your soul. Concern over your job or your home. Whatever they would be, you could write them out, pass them in, we could read them, and not one of them would James say, not one of them should stop us, if we are God's children, from considering it pure joy. What an extraordinary thing to say. Consider it all joy. This word consider is... uh, I think it shows us that James knows this, is, this isn't going to be our immediate emotional reaction to the situation. He's being realistic about it. This word consider means to count it, to calculate it. It may take some mental effort and energy to rearrange the furniture of your mind so as to understand this situation in this way. But that's what he's telling them to do in the imperative, to count it all joy, pure joy, nothing but joy. Deem it, count it, consider it. Holy joy, nothing but joy, entirely joy. Uh, James isn't pretending that going through trials is the greatest joy we could know. But he is saying that it is a ground for unmixed joy. That is, that our painful trials are a ground and an occasion for nothing but joy. What a different way to look at situations. The very situations that are preying on your mind, perhaps acutely, perhaps more over a long term, rather dully, but continuously. It's those that James is talking about here. When he says to count them, consider them nothing but joy. Consider it pure joy, my brother, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Well, I hope you feel wonderfully and energetically exhorted. There it is. That's the imperative. Consider pure joy. I could stop now. We could have 30 extra minutes to go have fellowship in the West Hall afterwards. But I have to wonder, well, how are we supposed to do this? It is such a strange thing we're being told to do. Such an unusual thing. Such a thing that is not like most of our experience. How do we consider hard situations pure joy? Well, James must have realized how bizarre this command would seem to them. So what he's doing in the passage that I read to you earlier, he is walking through, I think, trying to persuade them that trials, in fact, are reasons for joy. And I think in our passage that we read this morning, we see four reasons why this is the case. And it's these four reasons that I want to look at this morning. First, trials are the way to maturity. Trials are the way to maturity. Look again at verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Well, verses 3 and 4 then give the first reason for this strange command in verse 2. Very interesting that he doesn't suggest some kind of escapist denial of reality to be able to consider trials pure joy. He doesn't suggest some kind of superficial response to be able to come to this conclusion of rejoicing in trials. But he suggests a real knowledge. Sometimes we think the only way we're going to see a trial and endure it or be able to have joy in it is if we ignore it, if we block it out of our mind, if we deny its reality. Or we may try to come up with a very superficial response that allows us to deal with it quickly, glancingly, and then run on to something we like better. But James here seems to very clearly say that it's not this kind of denial or superficiality that will allow us to have joy in trials. It's actually knowing. Look look at verse 3. Because he says, you know, you know. Okay, you know what? What is this transforming knowledge? You know, he says, that this this trial, the testing of your faith, 
develops perseverance. So we must understand, we must know our trials as tests of our faith. We must come to understand our difficulties as opportunities for the demonstration of our faith. Do you remember those books uh, for children which you open it up and they appear to be blank pages, uh, but you take a pencil and you start just rubbing the pencil across it and an image comes out. I always particularly liked those because I was uh, drawingly challenged or however we would say it these days. I, I was not particularly good at drawing. And uh, so I loved it that I could buy a book and, you know, do this and come out with as good a drawing as the next guy. But uh, I think in a lot of ways what James is saying is our trials are kind of like those pencil marks going across the page. As these trials go back and forth in our lives, they reveal our faith. They demonstrate what is really there. Sometimes trials show that though there may have been long church membership, there's no real faith. Other times, these trials, I think, surprise some people with the fact that there has been a deep, abiding, and growing faith there, even though they've had doubts galore in their own mind. These trials, says James, they develop perseverance. They mature our faith. They slowly reveal the outlines of Christ in our lives as we respond to them. Particularly, James says, we can know that this testing of our faith develops or works in us perseverance. Now, you know, when we stop to think about this, we know this. This is sounding a little less strange now. We, we know this. We've seen this work. We know that testing develops. If you've got a product, you want to develop it and refine it, what do you do? You test it. You deliberately try it. You put it through trials to see how it will do. We've seen it if if you've been involved in sports. You know that working out, that testing and trying of your muscles will develop your physical abilities. We've seen how that works. We know it in marriage. Marriage, which will stretch us in all kinds of different ways, will sanctify us. It will build us up. Not because everything is good and easy in marriage or in any kind of athletic training schedule or in any kind of marketing of a new product. But because in all parts of life, it seems, when we want something to improve or develop, it must be tested. It must be tried. And though our flesh goes against this, we don't want anything hard. We desire to choose the easy way whenever we can. God, in his great love, tells us here through James that this kind of testing is for our good. Because this enduring of trials as a Christian both demonstrates and develops. It both proves and improves our faith. Without these trials, perseverance couldn't exist. We wouldn't have the strength. And James says that's not all. We see in verse 4 that this perseverance actually has a work to complete or to bring to maturity. So he says here perseverance must finish its work. Why? Well, he says right there in verse 4. So that you may be mature and complete. It seems that perseverance through difficulties is one of the ways that we are made whole. That we grow up. That we are completed to the point of, as he says here, not lacking anything. You've probably seen from time to time those pictures of Russian cosmonauts as they've landed back on earth. Very interesting that these people who are chosen to be particularly healthy human specimens, that when they land back on the earth, you see how they have to get out of their capsule? They're carried out. As healthy as they may be, they've been in an atmosphere, in in a place for months where there has been no resistance, no gravity. And so their muscles have atrophied. And so they have to be carried from their vehicle and reentry. You see, we need gravity in order to accustom our limbs to do the tasks they need to do. And without that difficulty or that resistance, our muscles atrophy. Well, just like we need gravity for our bodies to develop, we require challenging circumstances for our character to develop. Psychologists agree that the experience of stress is the way to maturity. That apart from that, maturity does not come. 
This is why James says that we can consider our trials to be occasions of joy, because we know that trials are the way to maturity. Oh, we could give example uh, after example of this from nature. You know, the butterfly in its chrysalis has to have enough strength to break out of that, of that beautiful cocoon, and it has to have that much strength in order to fly. If it didn't have that much strength, it wouldn't be any good for it to get out of the chrysalis because it would just fall to the ground. Those of us who are parents know that. How many hours do we give to trying to figure out, is this good or not good to do with our child? Because we don't want to make everything easy for them. We want to give them enough responsibility so that they feel what they need to learn, but not too much so that they're crushed. So just like we're like that with our children, so God is like that with us. He is letting us face these trials to build a kind of rounded, dynamic maturity in our faith. And trials and our responses to them are what God uses to produce this in us. In that sense, every irritation in life, every temptation and trial is an opportunity for maturity. Not one of them, not one of them is meant by God for evil. So far, then, is spiritual maturity from being attended by the effortless, mindless, mind over matter, no worries mate kind of attitude that some people associate with spiritual maturity Spiritual maturity actually seems to come not from avoiding hard times, but from actually having them. That seems to be how God says he will mature us. Testing brings spiritual toughness. Toughness brings a dynamic maturity which keeps us going with the Lord. Job is a wonderful example of this in the Old Testament. Look at all the many kinds of trials that Job had to face. But he did have faith. Those trials did not reveal finally that Job was faithless, but that by God's grace, he was faithful. And so those trials helped to mature and complete his faith as it was being filled out and tested in area after area. Job came to know more and he came to be more mature in his faith. Well, as for Job, so for us. As we follow God unswervingly through good times and bad, Our character becomes more like the character of Christ himself. And we show ourselves to be his followers. Of course, I know that we can usually see this, that this is how God uses difficulties to chasten and develop endurance or perseverance in others. We all know this sermon is true. Very few of you are sitting there thinking, oh, this doesn't make any sense. No, we're all going, yes, I can can see that. And we can all see that in other people. We have no problem with that, being able to look around and go, you know, this is just the kind of thing she needed. <laughs> this, I have been praying about this for years. Or maybe we can even look into our own past and we can see, oh, God used that very hard time in my life. But do you know where our blind spot seems to be? In our own present. Us now. Not with the hard thing we went through three years ago. Maybe we were bitter then, but we've seen how God kind of used it for good. And not with the hard thing Tom over there is going through, because, yeah, we, we, we can see how God may be using that. But it's what, with what we're going through right now in our own lives. And that's why I think James is imperative. His first word here in verse 2 is so powerful. Consider. He's addressing that to us now in the present. Consider it. Pure joy. It may seem a bit surprising, but when we think about it, we can see it. As Robert Browning Hamilton's verse says, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, a narrow word she said, but all the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Consider it pure joy when you face many kinds of trials because trials are the way to maturity. One of the main reasons trials mature us is the second reason James gives for us considering trials joy. Trials cause us to depend self-consciously on God. That's the second reason. Trials cause us to depend self-consciously on God. Look at verse 5. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. This consideration of trials as all joy, this knowledge that trials bring us to maturity may seem baffling to some. James realizes this. And so he presents a hypothetical situation to them, which I'm pretty sure he knew would have been the case with most of them anyway. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, that is, when you lack wisdom, when you realize that you are not yet fully complete, but that you still lack something, Lack what? Lack wisdom. Then what does he say you should do? Ask our giving God. Who not only gives, it says, but gives to all who ask him and does so generously and without finding fault. How amazing is this that God gives to us and he does it without rebuking us for our ignorance, without saying, I've already told you this. Without saying, you could have read your Bible and already known this. Why do I have to show you this? He does it generously without finding fault, rebuking us for our ignorance, for our lack of wisdom. He doesn't give it to us grudgingly and reproachfully, but generously in measure and in manner. But James does give us a condition for our asking. We must ask, he says, in faith, believing, as he says here in verse 6. Our turning to God for wisdom and trials cannot be for show. It cannot be superficial or hypocritical or calculating deceptively. It cannot be insincere and doubting. No, it must be an honest, straightforward cry to God as we realize, as we become aware, as we admit our dependence on Him. Why? Because a doubting, double-minded person, says James, is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the winds. Nothing is seriously being asked for. Nothing is really ready to be received by such a person. Nothing will be given. By this image, James suggests a situation of chaos and confusion rather than a clear, even painful sense of need. Such a hot and cold supplicant, says James in verse 7, should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Could he be clearer? This man is not behind his own request. He's not really asking for it fully. He's still of a divided mind, James says in verse 8. He's still really not quite sure if he needs this. And this double-mindedness makes him unsteady and unstable in everything that he does. In all the ways that he goes, this is him. Such a person does not yet fully recognize their dependence on the Lord, their need for Him and for His wisdom. And so, do you know what God does in His wisdom and love? He gives us more than we can bear. In His great and fatherly love, He piles it on us until we finally collapse under the weight of it, onto our knees, to be able to turn to Him in full sincerity of our hearts. To cry out from our whole hearts to Him for the wisdom that we need. Because we're all out of our own. Because we know the utter dependence that we have on Him to know what we should do. Well, you see the importance of this, don't you? This is the way that trials strengthen our faith. Because they cause us to practice the trusting God that we say we do. They cause us to trust God for things that we can't see right now. Friend, when all that we do during the day we can do in our own strength, how will we ever learn to rely on God? So God, in His love, puts us in circumstances in which we have no option. So many stories in the Bible are about this. You can probably think of some of your favorites. I think one of the best ones is with the children of Israel at the Red Sea. You know, they've all been delivered from bondage through amazing supernatural acts of God. Now here it is. They're being taken through the will. They're being led out to go to the promised land. And what happens? God leads them right up to an ocean, a piece of water they can't get over. 
Not only that, but the Egyptian army is behind them. They've got to move. They were following the leadership of God. He led them here. This doesn't quite make sense. And not only that, they can't make a feint to the left or the right because there are mountains on both sides. They're stuck. They're trapped. God led them there. Yeah. It seems very clear. God led them exactly there. Because he wanted to teach them how utterly trustworthy he is. Or a story from the life of Jesus. When Jesus is teaching the disciples one time in John chapter 6. It's one of my favorite stories of interaction between Jesus and the disciples. He's teaching about himself as the bread of life. And we read in uh, John 6 verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? The New English Bible says, who can stomach it? In the next verse, we read that the disciples were even grumbling about this. And that in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And at this point in the narrative, Jesus turns to his close disciples, the twelve, and he asks them, you don't want to leave me too, do you? A poignant question. And Peter has a great response to them. And Jesus turns and asks them, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Peter didn't say, Jesus, I hear what you've been teaching about yourself as the bread of life, and it makes complete sense. I have no questions. I'm signing on the bottom line. Actually, I really like it, Lord. This is just the kind of thing that I've been looking for. No, he doesn't say that at all. He seems to be acknowledging in his words, uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? Show me my options. You alone have the words of life. It'd be as if you were learning to scuba dive and uh, you're down under the water and your instructor has the, the, the canister with the oxygen in it and he gives you some, some from his mask and then he pulls it away. If you want some more, you only have one option if you can't get up above the water. You've got to go to that mask for that oxygen. Well, Peter wasn't saying that I've looked at all the options and I like this one best. He's saying there are no options. God in His great love shows us how He is unique and that He alone is the one that we're to trust. And He does this by exhausting us. Another example, of course, is what God is doing in you right now. What He is calling you to do. The hard situation that He has placed you in because of His love. God puts us in situations and trials which exhaust our own resources, in which we come to the end of ourselves. And friends, if you ever wonder where you'll find God, I'll tell you. By His grace, you'll often find Him at the end of yourself. And you'll never find Him anyplace else. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because trials cause us to depend self-consciously on God. A third reason, which we see here, which can allow us to endure trials with joy, is the simple knowledge that this life, with all its pain and trials, passes. Look at what James says in verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. James turns to those now whose lack is not of wisdom, but of position in this world. And he has a strange exhortation for them as well. He says to them, take pride. Boast. They may be considered by the world of small or little import, but James discerns their real position, that is, if they are brothers, as he addresses them here. Their real position, says James, is high. Conversely, what's the real position of the one who is rich? Low, he says. Now, that's not very obvious to us, is it? I mean, it's, it's the one with that car. It's the one with that job or that income or that career track. I mean, that's the one that we tend to think of as having a high position. Especially in a city like Washington, D.C., where people are known and identified for what they do, who they work for, what their position is. 
You go to reception, people quite naturally ask you what you do. Uh, Nothing surprising about that. And the conclusions that they draw from that in their own minds, they may be tacit, they may not be spoken, but they're still obvious. We know what is important and what is not important. Position is clear. Importance we take to be obvious. But James here is being just as ironic as he was in suggesting we should rejoice in trials. James is saying here that brothers in low circumstances should rejoice in their high position. And those who are rich and well provided for should be aware that all of these things that look so much like permanent possessions are really passing. Or to be more precise, as James says in verse 10, it's not the possessions that are passing, but the person himself, as he says there in verse 10, who will pass away like a wildflower. For James says the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. The wildflower exists but for a moment. And its most attractive features, its blossom and its beauty, those things about it which are most impressive are those things which are also passing. What does James say happens to the blossom? It falls. And its beauty is destroyed. Outward appearance does not guarantee a future. Neither for the plant nor for the person. In the same way, says James, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. In the middle of a busy day of ordering, in the middle of making an important deal, he's gone. None of the trappings of power delay death for a moment. His estate is settled, and the business goes on. That's the way it is, James says. The circumstances of the rich will ultimately be as humble as the poorest among them. The president and the pauper, the beggar and the billionaire will one day have, as the poet said, quietly mingled their bones in the dust. So much that appears to be so important and so permanent to our world, to us, is passing. John Wesley recounted, I was in the robe chamber adjoining to the House of Lords when the king put on his robes. His brow was much furrowed with age and quite clouded with care. And is this all the world can give even to a king? All the grandeur it can afford. A blanket of ermine around his shoulders, so heavy and cumbersome he can scarce move under it. A huge heap of borrowed hair. A few plates of gold and glittering stones upon his head. Alas, what a bauble is human greatness. And even this will not endure. Well, what does all this have to do with rejoicing in trials? Uh, James is saying here that we shouldn't rejoice in the wrong things that we so easily boast of. And that all of that which one may endure, all of those trials that come from being in humble circumstances, all of this is dependent, all of these trials, dependent on circumstances that are passing. In that sense, the Christian has never met a trial that will not end. You see, hope of our difficulties ending allows us to endure them now. And an endurance of present trials with the hope of some future joy can be the foundation of joy even now during the trial. Let me say that again. Hope of our difficulties ending allows us to endure them now. And an endurance of present trials with the hope of future joy can be the foundations of joy even now during the trial. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because this life, with all its pain and trials, is passing. Finally, James tells us, number four, that trials are a part of God's good purposes. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he will receive 
the, tr- the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. James is clearly saying here that an evil response to a trial is not inherent in the trial itself. An evil response to a trial is not inherent in the trial itself. That, That is, even if the trial comes from God, we cannot blame him for the temptation that we feel to evil in it. Understand that? You need to understand that. That's basically what James is saying here. The trial comes from God. Our temptation to do evil because of the trial, that's not from God. That's what James is saying here. So a a difficult marriage could tempt us to divorce. Financial shortages at work could tempt us to juggle the books. Embarrassing information could tempt us to lie. All these situations are trials to us. In them, we can feel tempted to evil. But these temptations that we feel to evil, these are not leadings from God. Understanding that the trial is from God is no license for us deciding that an evil response is of God. James clearly wants us to understand this. So he writes in verse 13, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Well, James' imagery here in verses 14 to 15 is is intense. And I'm not going to take more time to look at it right now. It would be worth your meditation when you go home this afternoon. Verses 14 and 15. But to skip to the end of that little progression, notice what he says sin eventually does. It gives birth. It gives birth to what? To death. Sin is pregnant with death. Sin, when it is full grown, when it has become a a fixed habit of determining the character of a person, brings forth... What's the fruition of all of this? Death. That's what sin brings forth. Regardless of its lovely appearance at the beginning, it brings forth death. Even as we'll see in the next chapter, in chapter 2, that faith is completed in action. So here James says sin is completed. Yes, what is that that it yearns for that will complete it? Sin is completed in death. So death is brought to full fruition by sin. The fullness of sin, its end point, that to which it tends, its maturity, when it's all grown up and its full glory is death. And if we coddle it when it looks little and sweet and harmless and attractive and enticing, as James says here, we do it to our own destruction. Verse 16 is a great verse to memorize. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. In 1662, because he could not in good conscience affirm all the particulars about the Church of England, Edmund Calamy was was forced out of his pastorate, along with 2,000 other pastors on that day in England. He had a final day to preach his final sermon to his people. In his farewell sermon, he warned them about the deceitfulness of sin. He said, maybe some will say, I have committed many sins, but am not brought into any strait. Remember. It was nine months after David had numbered the people before he was in this strait. But as sure as God is in heaven, sin will bring straits sooner or later. Though one sin a hundred years, yet shall he be accursed. Maybe thy prosperity makes way for thy damnation. And this is thy greatest distress, that thou goest on in sin and Prosperity. Temptation to sin 
is by its very nature deceptive. The danger of our being deceived about God during difficult times is particularly keen. We may be tempted to feel that God is cruel or bad, but it's not so, he's saying. Evil is not of God. Evil is from us and tends to death. But don't be deceived, my dear brothers, he implores in verse 16. God is good. It is God who gives us life. Verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God is the unchanging source, not of evil, but of good. And so we are able to trust him. And there's an important thing we learn here, an important difference between trusting that you know what God's good purposes are and trusting that God has good purposes. It's vital you know that. That's, that's, in a lot of ways, that's his fourth reason. If you're taking notes, you need to get that down in a way you understand it. There's a lot of difference between knowing what the purposes are you think God is using this to and trusting that God has good purposes. Many times, by God's grace, we'll be able to figure out what he's doing in a situation. We'll be able to see some good that's going to come from it. But there are in all of our lives circumstances which will come, which will shatter even the most practiced ability to figure out how something's going to be used for good in our lives. And it's at times like that where we see if we've been trusting our own cleverness, seeing if we can figure out how it will be used, Or if we have, in fact, been trusting God, coming to understand Him, His goodness, His truthfulness, His well-meaning toward us. God is perfect, he says here. He's in no need of change. It may be disturbing to those who are in opposition to God. It's wonderfully comforting to those of us who rely on Him and trust Him. So this God, we read in verse 18, chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. Sin is deceptively enticing. Its allure leads only to death. But God, even if he is the author of trials, they only appear bad. He gives us life. Birth, as he says here in verse 18, through the word of truth. So we read in verse 12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Trials, too, are good gifts from God. They are the means through which God will mature us and will teach us more of his own fullness for us. And they may quicken our desire for him and they will become the ground of his displaying his glory through us. These trials are meant by God for our good. Trials, consider it, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you can be certain that trials are a part of God's Good purposes. Well, in conclusion, let me simply say that embracing trials like James is talking about here, like rejoicing in them, doesn't mean pretending they're not trials. James isn't calling us to let our reactions be determined by how we first feel. He's calling us to weigh through our responses, to look at things quite deliberately and intentionally. And we know this in so many areas of life. Parents, doctors, public servants, so many people have to sort through things far beyond just an initial reaction. That's what you have to do with a friend if you're faithful to them so many times. We can't well respond to many things on the basis of how they simply immediately feel to us. So as one writer has summed up James here, he says, don't, James is saying, don't put off your life of faith until times get better. Right now, in the middle of your suffering." is the very time to be putting your servanthood toward Christ into practice. And be aware that God is glorified in our perseverance in trials. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Through every trial, we learn God's sufficiency. We, like Paul with his thorn, display his strength through our weakness. No pain, no gain is true, not just of muscle mass or athletic stamina, but of our spiritual maturity, of our Christian character, and somehow, it seems, even of God's glory. What a wonderful privilege it is, then, when God is sure enough of us 
to display His strength through our weakness. Friend, in that sense, each trial you undergo as a Christian is a tribute by God to His own work in you as He intends to display His glory. Andrew Murray was a well-known South African Christian leader. He helped engender mission schools and other social, educational, evangelistic movements around South Africa in the last part of the last century, in the beginning of this. He wrote many books that are still widely read. But celebrated man though he was, he knew trials. He had a a normal life with difficulties like you and I face. He had uh, a wife and family. He had a job. He was a pastor. He had a demanding schedule of speaking and writing and preaching. He survived his wife of many years. He survived her for over a decade, knowing a kind of loneliness that only the bereaved among us have yet known. Blessed as his life was, as with all of us, he knew pain. Let me give you then in conclusion his thoughts that he penned to himself on trials. First, he, God, brought me here. It is by his will I am in this straight place. In that fact, I will rest. Next, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace to behave as his child. Then he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lessons he intends me to learn and working in me the grace he means to bestow. Last, in his good time, he can bring me out again, how and when he knows. Let me say then, I am here, one, by God's appointment, two, in his keeping, three, under his training, four, for his time. Let me say I am here, one, by God's appointment, two, in his keeping, three, under his training, four, for his time. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning as a body, we know that our trials are more numerous than we are. In each one of our lives, Lord, we face several different things at once which would try us. Lord, we pray that the spirit that James writes of here of joy would infect our lives. Pray, Lord, that you would help us to give over a bitterness or a resentment that so naturally seems to come to us when things are difficult. We pray, Father, that you would give us a certainty of your good work in trials, of their passing nature, of the way you intend to mature our faith through them. Lord, we praise you for your goodness to us. We pray that you would teach us what it means to rely on you and to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials. We pray for your glory's sake. Amen.